Today we're going to be demonstrating some of the gameplay of Royal Steward. My wife is the assistant who is going to be performing the actions. I'm going to be narrating. So the first thing we're doing is placing all the terrain tiles into the bag so that they can be shuffled and randomly drawn. She's also going to roll a six-sided die which will determine where the village will be placed on the terrain board. A five is the lower left corner. So we place our village piece and now she will randomly draw the terrain tiles and begin placing them on the land tiles. The ocean and beach always exists so you skip those. So our first terrain tile drawn there was the plains. Now we have tundra. forest. So you will notice that she is placing the terrain tiles over the X's which designate the possibilities of where the village could go. Since it's already determined those other X's are now useless. Okay now she drew a lake tile. Anytime a lake tile is drawn a die needs to be rolled. If it's odd, such as that, then a river must connect the lake to the nearest ocean tile. So since we already had a forest tile there, we remove it and replace it with a river tile. And as you'll see, she's just started, started in the upper left, continues going right and then down. Now since that lake tile was drawn right next to the beach, we do not have to roll to see if we need to connect a river. We'll just repeat this process until the entire terrain board is filled. Okay, so now she drew a volcano tile. That is a special tile that will be used during the game. At the beginning of each season, we have to roll a die to see if it erupts. Now that the terrain has been determined and completed, we're going to figure out which occupations are removed from the game. So we shall roll a eight-sided die twice and determine the row and column. Then we use one of the black hex tiles to replace the occupation. So we lost the dire. Row seven, column six. We'll just repeat this process until five occupations have been removed. Okay, so we lost the peddler, Wainwright, beekeeper, bone carver, and dyer. The next step is to shuffle the bonus cards. Each player that is playing will receive two bonus cards. And of course the game is for one to four players. So we're going to be playing as two players right now. So now the bonus cards are distributed. And each player can look and see what their cards say. This one is map reading. Gives the player plus five movement points. The other one is fire roasting. Once per season, the player may convert up to 10 raw meat, poultry, and seafood to 10 cooked meat, poultry, and seafood. And they earn one prestige point for the first time the action is performed. And the other player received Shearing and Draper. Normally the player will keep their bonus cards to themselves and keep them face down so the other players won't know what types of strategies they may be utilizing. 
The next part is to shuffle the random event cards. There's random events for three of the seasons, summer, fall, and winter. So after the cards have been shuffled, one will be randomly drawn and placed face down on the appropriate season, on the season tracker. So there's the summer card indicated by green. Fall is indicated by the red color. And winter is white. During the game, a player can pay the profit to be able to take a peek at these random events. This can help them plan their strategy, but some players may determine they want to use no money and take a risk. Now we place the turn tracker piece on the first turn. The game has 12 turns, one representing each month. Therefore, there's three turns in the spring season. The next thing we do is determine who the starting player is. So the player that rolled the four gets to start. The starting player receives 300 silver, and the next player receives 350 because of the disadvantage of going second. If there was more than two players, they would receive even more money. One of the reasons behind this is when the final scoring occurs, whoever plays a given occupation first receives two bonus prestige points. So it makes it more difficult to follow if your player is two, three, or four. The next step is for each player to choose a color and take the associated colored hex tiles and player tokens. So this player chooses green, the other is choosing purple. Before the game begins, there's a lot of planning in Royal Steward. Players will determine their strategy based on the bonus cards they receive and the terrain that has been generated. For example, in this case, the village is actually surrounded by all terrain types that cannot be traversed unless you have special equipment. The lake requires some type of boat or raft in order to cross it. The desert requires cool clothing and the mountains require rope, boots, and warm clothing. So this scenario is not prone for traveling. After a player kind of determines their overall strategy of what occupations they're going to use, again taking into account the fact that some of them have been removed from the game, they will begin buying things from the marketplace. Since each player starts with 300 silver, they need to really choose wisely when making purchases. This is the only time during the game that a player can buy items from the marketplace at list price. So you can also purchase tools from the marketplace as well as animals. Tools are almost a necessity when playing most of the occupations, so you have to choose wisely. Now there is also a cargo ship that can be built or purchased during the game. It's very expensive and hard to make, but that allows you to once per season send it abroad and sell 500 silver worth of resources and buy 500 silver worth of resources. And in doing so, you can get them at list price and sell them at list price. Otherwise, if using the marketplace later during the game at the end of season, you're going to have to pay twice the amount of the list price. And when you sell your resources, you only receive half the amount. Because of the desert terrain tile, which surrounds the village, we need cool clothing to get out. So Lori is buying some linen clothing by placing a single red cube in the one quantity column. It costs 35 silver pieces. So now she has to make change from the 300 silver that she has. Next, she has decided to buy five milk, which actually counts as food and drink in Royal Steward. 
So she's placing a single yellow token on the one quantity. The yellow cubes are actually a five multiplier. So now she has to pay 50 silver. So we finished buying all of our resources based on our plan. You'll notice we're using a combination of 5x multipliers and single quantity cubes. And we determined what we needed to buy based on the occupations that we're going to be using. One of them is the cartographer. Since we have the map reading bonus card, which gives us movement point bonus if we have a map, we have decided to make one. We could have just purchased it from the marketplace, but it would have cost quite a bit. This way we can actually make it and earn some points at the same time. So all we have left after making all of our purchases is 12 silver pieces. Player 2 also finished their inventory purchases, and then the game is ready to begin. The first occupation that Player 1 will be using is the cartographer. With this occupation, they can utilize ink and either paper, papyrus, or parchment in order to produce maps. They can get two points for producing a map on water tiles and two points for producing a map on land tile. The player will now be traveling so they will place the black movement token onto position 10 which is the default movement points for each player and carrying capacity of 10 by using a white cylinder. Next the player places their token onto the village tile and now they can decide which direction they're going to go. Since this player does have a raft they can decide to travel across lakes and rivers but even without having any type of water transportation you can still visit a lake or river tile you just cannot cross them. So the player moves to a lake tile first which takes one movement point. This in turn gives them two prestige points according to this occupation. So now the player places their other token onto the second position of the points tracker. But since there's movement points left, there's time to travel somewhere else and make another map. So if we travel to the plains, that only takes one movement point. Now we're in position eight. Now, looking back at the cartographer, you'll notice that it requires tools. You have to have either a reed pen or quill pen, and it consumes one ink and one paper, papyrus, or parchment. So since we've done this twice already, we're going to come over to our inventory, and we're going to remove ink. We have two, so we simply remove these two cubes from position one, and we happen to have paper, so we remove these two cubes from our inventory list. Now since we have done this twice, once again we get two more points. And now it's up to the player to decide if they had more resources to make maps by going to other tiles. Doing so would not produce more points, but it would produce maps. And then in turn you could sell the maps. But in our example here, we don't have any more ink or paper, so we can't make any more. So this turn is finished. Now because the other player has a bonus card of Draper, which allows selling of dry goods for full price at any time, their master plan is to be a farmer. And in order to do that, he's going to need some equipment, some plowing equipment and things of that nature. And in order to use the miller later in the game, in order to produce flour from some grains, 
he's going to need a lot of barrels. Since we don't have barrels in our inventory right now because they're kind of expensive, we're going to use the Cooper occupation first. And the Cooper needs a hammer, a chisel or knife, and axe or saw. So first we need to double check our tools to make sure we have these items. We have an axe, we have a chisel, and we have a hammer. So we're good with tools. So now we go back and look at our consumables. So almost all the consumables are oak in these cases. And if we look at our inventory, we actually have 40 oak, so we have plenty to work with. So now this occupation doesn't require any kind of traveling, so we're not going to be using the terrain board while performing these actions. So the first thing we're going to do is produce some barrels. You'll notice that it takes two oak to produce two barrels, and that gives one point. This action can be performed four times, so as long as you have enough wood you can do this. You only get points for the first time the action is performed, however. But once again, you can produce other products, which can in turn be used for silver or gives you points at the end of the game based on your silver. So we're going to go ahead and produce eight barrels. So what we need to do is use up eight oak. So we're going to remove one of the tens. And now we get two more in the one column leaving us with 32 and we produced eight barrels so now what we do is come over to barrel and do two in the threes column which gives us six and then we can place two more in the one column giving us a total of eight barrels and we'll repeat the same actions for making a butter churn, chess, and buckets. Now that we've produced the chess, barrels, buckets, and butter churns, there's one more step for this particular play. If we look in the notes section and we see the pound symbol next to the chess and buckets, it says place a colored hex tile in the appropriate indicator of the special resources map. So now we come over to the special resources mat. The purpose of this mat is to remind the players that they have something special. So what we're going to do is find the chest position. And since we're purple, we just simply place one of our hex tiles on there. And the same for the buckets. Now the reason why these are considered special is because both of those increase uh, person's carrying capacity so that while they're traveling on the terrain board they can carry more items. Now both of these types of carrying capacity increases are for carrying. You must carry them in the hands which means you can only use one of these and here if we look at one of our helper tips you'll see that the chest is of type hands and the increase is five whereas the bucket is also for hands and it's three. So essentially the chest would be what we would use to increase our carrying capacity because you can only have one at a time in your hands. Just to quickly mention, the backpack for example is on your back, saddle bags or if you have a horse or an ox, and then there's transports such as a canoe, hand cart, wagon, etc. And finally, the last action to perform is to give the points for this player, which once again ends up to be four points. So after the first turn, we're at a tie. Next thing to do is to move the turn tracker. And the process begins again. Now, one thing that I did forget to mention is when you play an occupation, the first thing that you do is place one of your hex tokens on the occupation tracker. That way you'll know that you were the first one to play. If someone else has played it, you still can, but you're not going to get the two bonus points.
at the end of the game for each occupation. Since we're on turn two, the next player will be playing the clay worker. One of the actions from the clay worker produces an adobe. So again, I'm using the special resources map, we place one of our colored hex tokens on the adobe location. And we also get an oven. Incidentally, while the active player is using the Occupations and Actions manual, which has all the details, the other players can be looking through the helper mats. For example, the Occupation Helper basically shows what tools a given occupation uses, what types of consumables, where they travel, and the types of products they produce. Each player has one of those. There's also a shared Occupations and Resources manual which shows you a given occupation, what they consume, required tools, where they travel and produces. In addition, there's pages for particular products. So you could look at the pearl, for example, and see that the fisherman produces it. Pearls are utilized by the jeweler. So it lists every single one of the resources. Now that player two has barrels, they're going to use the miller occupation in order to produce flour. They're also going to be producing grist and sand. And you'll notice in the note, it says that flour and grist cannot be combined in the same barrel. Two barrels must be used. Now after turn two, you'll notice that the purple player has a five point lead. So once again, we move the turn tracker to turn number three. After this turn, the season will be changing and we will show what happens next. Now at the end of season, players are going to have to pay food and drink, or they will have to take begging tokens, which significantly decrease your points. So player one double checks, make sure they have enough. They happen to have five milk, which counts as both food and drink. So they're good for season one, but knowing that they're going to need more food and drink later, they're preparing by performing the fisherman occupation next. The player has wisely chosen a fisherman because there happens to be a lake right next to the village. In addition, there's a beach and ocean, of course. And since the village started toward the edge of the terrain map, they have quicker access to those. And the fisherman happens to be able to get the best fish off the beach and the ocean. The fisherman has some actions that actually utilize the dice. So in doing so, we ended up getting crab, carp, and shrimp. But we converted it to raw seafood so that we'll be able to use it as a food source later on. Some occupations are what I consider gathering occupations that will get resources from nothing. Others, such as the fishermen, can also convert resources from one type to another, such as converting shrimp to raw seafood. And then some others are just performing services. They don't produce any real goods, and they just in turn are used to get you points. Player 2 suddenly realizes that they have no food or drink in their inventory so that they're going to end up having to take begging tokens. But they realize that they can use their draper bonus to sell the dry goods at any time. So what he's decided to do is sell the flour. So these are 5x multipliers. This means they have 100 flour. So you take 100 times 5, that gives 500 silver pieces for getting rid of the flour that was produced by the miller. Sounds great. That does not take the turn because they did not use an occupation action. The draper action can be performed at any time because it's a bonus card. Now, the marketplace is normally played at the end of a season, but we're not there yet. 
So they could either wait till the end of the season to purchase some food and drink to cover this season, or they could use one of the other occupations, such as the peddler, which happens to be out in this game. You'll notice the black hex from earlier, so that's not available. But there's also the money lender. The money lender is a way to use the marketplace on the fly as well. But again, the player's in no danger because the marketplace can be played at the end of the season. So they have decided to not play the money lender at this time. Incidentally, there are various money tokens. So when selling the flower, you could either take five 100s or you can mix, of course, 20s or you could take a single 500, but then you'll end up having to probably make change. So usually it's typically easier to have some smaller ones combined. So the player has chosen to play the animal handler at this time. The animal handler will allow him to use the terrain board and visit various terrain tiles in order to roll dice to determine what kinds of animals he has. The animals then follows them back to the village. Basically, he's domesticating them. The plan is to perhaps get milk from any captured sheep or goats in the future. It'll be doubtful that he'll find a cow, but you never know. He may get lucky. And there's also eggs that you could get from chickens and things of that nature. Now is the perfect time to point out how often people will be making mistakes in Royal Steward. The player has figured out that they don't have any type of cool clothing, boots, any type of boat, and as we mentioned before, the village is surrounded by lakes, deserts, and mountains because you can only travel at a 90 degree angle. Now that the player has realized they made a mistake, they go back on their decision to play the animal handler this time until they can get the equipment to get out. Instead, decides to play basically a homebody such as the carpenter until they can purchase the required equipment from the marketplace at the end of the season. Now that turn three is finished, there are quite a few things that have to be done before starting the next season. The helper mat can display this to the players so they know what to do. The first action is to get house and rental income. Our only player to have a house is the green player. They have an adobe. So the next thing we do is look at our helper card to find out how much income they get from this. The adobe happens to produce 35 silver. Next both players can perform shopping at the marketplace. The purple player remembers that he's going to need five drink and three food at the end of season one. So he decides to buy five ale, which doing so from the marketplace requires five times the normal cost. So each ale is 25, so it's going to cost 125 silver to purchase enough ale for this season in order to not get any begging tokens. There are many different types of food sources in the game. Drink always converts one to one, but food has different ratios. So basically you can look at the marketplace and determine what types of food you want to buy. Since we need to have three food and cheese provides a conversion rate of three to one, all we need to do is buy one cheese. So five times five is 25 silver. Also, the purple player remembers that he can't get out of the village, so he decides to buy cotton clothing, which counts as cool clothing, in order to visit the desert tile adjacent to the village. Or he could get out now because he has a raft, which allows him to cross lakes. Once all shopping is done, it's time for the players to pay their food and drink. And once again, if a player is missing any drink or food, for each one missing, they must take a begging token, which decreases their score at the end of the game. 
And finally, if the players have any animals and they are in the winter season, they have to tend to the animals. In other words, they have to feed them. But since we're in the spring, that is not the case. We simply move on to the next season. Since this particular game happens to have a volcano tile, we must roll one die to see if the volcano erupts. If it's a one, it will. Three, so we're safe from the volcano. Next, we have to turn over the random event card. Neither player has paid the profit, so nobody knows what's coming. Happens to be the forest fire. No travel may be performed on any forest tile for the season. Colliers may collect 20 charcoal from visiting a forest tile during the following season. So this is bad news for foresters and lumberjacks if someone was going to plan on playing those during this season. So now the occupation actions just simply continue. We slide the card over here and move the turn tracker to the next turn. The players will play three more turns until once again it's the end of the season. And when it's the beginning of the next, you turn the card over. And in this case, they got a no event card, so nothing special happens in the fall. And finally, once they reach winter, once again there's a random event. In this case, we have a wolf attack. So half of the live animals are lost unless the engineer created a fence or at least one wolf is owned. And there is the list of the types of animals affected. So as you can see, playing the profit during the game could have prevented this if you had purchased animals or bred animals. You could have planned and either tried to obtain a wolf or build a fence. Now usually a player by the end of the game will reach at least 50 prestige points. So once they reach the 50 position, they will obtain a plus 50 token and keep that. And if the game keeps going and they get enough points, it may flip over to 100 points. But then they simply start over toward the top of the tracker for the remaining points. Incidentally, if a player does have animals and it's a normal winter, they're required to feed them. Animals for making the game easier can be fed with any type of food, even though that's not realistic. Or you can use hay if you had either purchased it or gathered it as a farmer. So the helper table shows you for various quantities of animals, how many points you get for owning those at the end of each season, as well as how much bulk or space they take up when you're trying to carry them, and how much food it requires in the winter. The manual explains more about how to tend to animals, in addition to every topic in the game. The helpers are just there kind of as a quick reference guide to make it easier while playing. Finally, the game would be over and we have to add up the points for each player to see what their end score is. So of course we've been keeping track of points throughout the game on the points tracker, but then we also get some various points based on some other things such as how many occupations the player played first, how much silver's left at the end of the game for every 100 silver pieces you get two points, if a person received begging tokens, you will lose one point per token. And if you had used the money lender and borrowed some money, if you did not pay, repay the debt and have some debt tokens, you'll lose four prestige points. Now, there is one final marketplace action at the end of the game, but 
Normal marketplace actions only result in half the amount of silver. You only receive half when selling. The exception to that is animals. If you own animals and they're alive and you're able to feed them and keep them alive in the winter time, then you will receive the full silver value for those. Now even though the marketplace does have those types of limitations on selling, there are a couple other ways where you can get full price for selling goods. One is if you happen to build or buy a cargo ship, you can send it away each season and make full price on up to 500 silver. The peddler can also result in full prices, but once again they're limited with how much they can sell at a given point in time. But those are two alternatives and Royal Steward is full of alternatives. The game is quite diverse and complicated. The reason for this is I wanted to make a game that would be playable and enjoyable for a long period of time because I tend to get bored quite easily with games. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief walkthrough and I hope your interest in Royal Steward has peaked at this point. Thank you.